All right, here we go. Trey D, welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Ready to hurt some feelings again? <laughs> Ready to hurt some feelings? I don't think we heard that many this time. They didn't got used to us now. They know we're going to keep it blunt and direct. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, like we always do. Uh, yeah. Some years running now. Yeah. I think maybe since 2013, was it? I think it was 14. 14, maybe? Yeah, 14. yeah cause I remember I just moved to LA not too long before. Yeah. Right. About right. five years running. Shout out to my homeboy, Gerald, man, Stymie. You know what I mean? He he keeps the plug with your guy, Evan. That's you right. Know? So, yeah. That's right, man. Always yeah. a pleasure to have you back. No doubt. I always enjoy sitting there, man. Yes, sir. All right, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get into the top of the news right now. Yeah. You actually knew Nipsey Hussle. Yeah, I did. How close do you guys uh, know each other? Um, we knew each other as you would expect a OG Crip and a young Crip that's both representing their hoods the right way would merge with one another. Mm-hmm. You know, when I when I was released from prison in 2014, not long thereafter. He had a a show, uh, he was doing it for a radio station, and he said, you know, he contacted us and said, Mm. you know, I used a part of y'all song in my intro, so, you know, would you and Goldie Loke want to come out on stage with me for this show and and perform? You know, he had like 12 minutes, and it was like a real short set where once you was through with your set, the stage rotates for the next act, so Mm -hmm. you can't bogart the stage. And uh, he gave us a couple of minutes up there to, to do our thing with him, and you know what I'm saying? He did his thing. It was, it was that was, that was my introduction to him personally. And after that, you know, I talked about getting him on my third coming album. And at that time, he was going through some personal issues into me waiting on to get the verse from him. And uh, you know, I understood that, you know, so. It didn't happen, but you know, like a man, like a real young homie, he, you know, he got back with me when he got straight and said, you know, it'll be another time, D, my bad on that, you know, and he didn't have to do none of that. So mm-hmm. I really appreciated the respect he gave me. And, you know, I hung out with him at at a couple of shows he did at the observatory and in LA and things like that. I just had his back as an OG. You know, I saw I saw him coming up, I knew the perils he would face in the game and it wasn't like I was a protector or nothing like that, but it was just, you know, I, I gravitated toward him cause I might see something that he would miss, yeah. you know? So I, I wanted to be there in that capacity of support for him and he showed me the same love back. You know, Nipsey was one of the few successful rappers that continued to stay in his neighborhood and actually try to build up his neighborhood. Have you ever seen any other rappers actually do that? Like, for example, in Long Beach, are there any businesses in Long Beach started by Long Beach rappers? I'm sure there's a couple. But, but not, not any prominent ones you could think of? No. Not, uh, not whole squares and, you know, prominent real estate or, you know, that of note. You know, so maybe they've done something that's not, um, you know, broadcast to the general public. But nah, I haven't seen nobody work like that right where they come from and and build from within like that. And he had a big heart. He was a small guy, man, you know, in stature, but his heart was gigantic, you know. So, I mean, just in a a, a charitable and loving way, but I mean, it's courageously as well you know he didn't back down and you know he, he stood for what he represented yeah man because people will come out of a low lower income neighborhood they'll do well they'll buy a house somewhere else mm-hmm. and then you'll hear of businesses being done in affluent areas and you know people will open a store on fairfax but he opened a store on crenshaw and slauson which is rolling 60s you know, through right. and through. I think that was a kind of passion for his, for he, for him, because I say it was a passion for his because they they took 
they took the liberty of trying to run him off of that property when he was just trying to dump some mixtapes. You got a business that does something that you don't, you ain't selling no mixtapes. So yeah, you see a young guy doing something positive and legal, you know, maybe not legal as far as having a license for it or a permit, but I'm not harming nobody. I'm not bringing no bad traffic around here. Mm -hmm. And they ran him off of that property. You know, they used to run him off of there. So when when he got, when he was able to, he like, okay, cool. You know, now y'all work for me. Y'all can keep y'all businesses and all that, but this is, you know, y'all paying me now. So it was, it was kind of a boss move at the same time, yeah. but at the same time, I respect that he did it right there where he came from. He used to work right up the street um, at nine years old at Chamber Shoe Shoe Shop. It's hmm. like right, it's like right down the street from his marathon store where he was, you know, where he was murdered at. Yeah, man. It so was, he stayed uh, there. That's his heart, you know. Yeah. That's his heart, and he did that. I mean, but you know, in not even in defense of other artists who made it big and left their neighborhoods or whatever, but just the reality. You can't help the whole world at once. So I give Nip's prop I give Nip props for being the kind of person that he took whatever heat came with him being there. And you know he faced it. He didn't run from it. And you know, it's like this what I want to do, this what I'm committed to. I got my young squad with me, you know, and ain't nobody going to run us. You know what I'm saying? This is what we doing right here. And he planted his flag, you know, and, and, and I respect that a whole lot. But in defense, like I said, but not really in defense of other artists, man, you, it's a nonstop gimme. I need, uh, help me. Uh, why you ain't doing this? Why you haven't put no business here? Why you haven't did this? Why you? And half of these people, if they had the opportunity, they wouldn't do shit themselves. That's asking these questions. Right. So, exactly. So, 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 you know, I don't begrudge nobody really how they operate with their own money. You know, but in in honor of Nip, he had the heart to stay there and do that. That's why I said he faced whatever came with that. That's what he was committed to do. Like I'm doing it right here in the hood and in the hood, I'm bringing the hood with me, you know? And that was a G move. Well, yeah, and I think it's really dope that he took this area, this Crenshaw district, and started putting it on T-shirts, started naming his album that, and started branding this area that no one was really talking about. I mean, I remember on some Death Row album, like I remember Corrupt, Corrupt goes, yeah, Corrupt. you know, bring, your ass, you bring your ass to Crenshaw Slauson. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, I stranded that on Death Row. That's not dangerous the way he's saying it, like, you know. <laughs> that was that song, Stranded on Death Row. Yeah, th there you go, yeah. Stranded on Death Row. There we yeah. go. That was yeah. the song. And I'm like, I, that was the first time I heard Crenshaw or Crenshaw Slauson, because I was living in the Bay at the time. I, exactly. I wasn't from L.A. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then Nipsey starts talking about it, and, and everyone's wearing the shirts, and he's branding that and turning it into a tourist destination. It almost reminded me of when Snoop first came out. I never even really heard of Long Beach. True, <laughs> you know? True. Uh, if you're not living in LA, you had never heard of Long Beach before Snoop Dogg. Pretty much, you hadn't. It is what it is. Yeah. This was not, you heard of LA, of course. And Compton. And you heard of Compton. Yeah. Easy, easy put that on what? Well, easy put Todd that on the map. Toddy T and, you know, Mix Master Spain. Really and easy. All those. Let's, 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 let's keep it easy. 100. Okay. Shout out to, to the originators. <laughs> shout, shout to no them. Doubt. But living, like I said, living outside of LA, yeah. Com easy was the first person to Agreed. say Compton. Agreed. And Snoop was the first person to say Long Beach. And I remember he had the hat that said LBC. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. think about if Snoop had actually branded that and started stores and started LBC clothing and, and I'm not sure, it doesn't seem like he did that consistently throughout. No, no. But Nipsey really took it upon himself. He had other interests because he got so big so fast, I believe that, yeah. you know, he had uh, St. Ives sponsoring him right. back then and different other kind of entities, you know, that, that um, got behind him. So he was more like a brand ambassador. Yeah, like a know. spokesman. Yeah, yeah. But, but Nipsey actually owned his shit. Yes, he did. Which I think is very commendable. No doubt. And then actually owned the property that sold the shit.
Yeah. So he's like kind of running it, the whole vertical of it yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Very um, sharp young man. He always, you know, whenever we did spend time in each other's company and dialogue, it would always be about either history or something in the future that, you know, would would benefit what we was doing as artists. You know, it was you know, and if we was talking about some street shit, it was just it just happened to come up. Right. But, you know. Well yeah, I remember when I interviewed him, I did one interview with him, a sit down, uh, some years back. And when I started speaking about the whole Rolling Sixties thing, mm -hmm. he said, Yeah, you know, the first thing he pointed out was the Rolling Sixties was one of the most enterprising gangs in terms of business and corporate strategy and stuff like that. That was the first thing he mentioned. Our generation, you know what I'm saying, was kind of responsible for like putting it on the map in terms of like hustling and business and you know what I'm saying, like making moves outside of the streets, you know what I'm saying, and taking it to, you know, a corporate level. Not not necessarily taking gangbanging, but taking the legacy of our area to, to like, you know, the corporate level. They start off with money, really. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's they come from a pretty affluent area of LA. You know, they 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 don't got ramshackle houses with half the fence hanging off. You yeah. know, just, you can step over, and you know it's not like that over there. You know, they they come from money pretty much, so it's only natural. That's why they call themselves the rich rolling sixties. Mm. Got you it. Yeah. Got it. So then, the shooting happens. Mm. I remember first getting the news and you hear about you heard about three people getting shot and one person getting killed but it, it, at first it wasn't Nipsey mm -hmm. that got killed it's like okay well Nipsey got shot and someone else got killed unfortunately but Nipsey's going to be okay there were some pictures of him like in a band You put or that in your own head No whoever was, heard that put yeah, that in that Yeah own it was head. it was starting to just float around but it wasn't Nipsey and then suddenly rest in peace Nipsey Hustle when you first heard those, you know, those set of reports, what did you think? I thought my fourth wedding anniversary is now shared with this tragedy. I was in Malibu with a picnic basket and <laughs> wine and, you yeah. know, on the coastline lounging, you know, and, um, you know, my wife from over there, Cognac. So she got the news instantaneously, you know. Oh, your wife's like, from the Rolling Sixties? Yeah. Okay. So um, we was getting blow by blow and play by play as kind of like it was unfolding. And it went from here, you know, to like here and kind of leveled off somewhere right here. And it was, you know, we made the most out of the rest of the day, but yeah, I, I'm still in mourning. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. It's like we report on a lot of artists dying over the last 10 years, but there's something about Nipsey's death that just, it was like a cloud, a dark cloud over all of hip hop. It was. It's like no one wanted to drop any new music. Nobody was promotion even. Promotion off my new album. Yeah, promotion yeah. stopped. Yeah. We didn't even want to, re like, reporting on happy stories seemed sort of weird. It, it was yeah. Like, yeah, you, you know, couldn't someone, make light of anything. You couldn't make light the, of anything. Yeah. And I, I, I was saying this, and people were like, oh, no, this is happening everywhere. I'm like, well, L.A. is ground zero. And me being in L.A., you, you just felt the sadness in the air. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you find out that, in fact, he, he did die. And then the video came out. Did you watch it? Not at all. You didn't watch the video. I never will watch it. Okay. I don't don't want to see my guy go out like that at all. I I was told by a couple of friends of mine, and they was like, you know, they asked, "Have you seen? Did you see?" And I was like, "No, I haven't." And then they described what was happening. I was like, "Man, look," I said, "Okay, cool. I I got the picture, and I don't want to see the picture. I don't want that embedded in my memory. I don't. I don't." I had too much love for the for him, you know what I'm saying, for the young brother, man. He was he was too powerful, man, to really for for me to even wanna uh, you know, connect that, that 
especially the guy, you know, who did it, man. You know what I mean? He wasn't yeah. even supposed to be, <laughs> he wasn't even supposed to be over there. He wasn't even supposed to be, have access to approaching Nip like that. So just the whole unfolding of that, I mean, it's just like sad, man. Did you know this dude shitty cuz? Too young. Too young. He's too young for me. Okay. To know. Does your wife know know of this guy? No, he's no, not. She no, no. My wife comes from over there. You know what I'm saying? My, that's my wife now. You know, she's the mother and the businesswoman and yeah. things of that nature. So she don't, you know, okay. she don't connect to the streets in that capacity anymore. Right. But that's her hood. Her though. hood, right. Yeah. Well, I know people who live over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say that whenever they drive past, you know, his store, a lot of times he'd be hanging out there like all day, taking pictures with people, chilling. You know, sometimes he'd be by himself, sometimes a couple of guys would be around him, but he was very accessible. You could walk up to him and talk to him anytime. He didn't have, you know, I remember at one point me and Buster Rhymes were hanging out and like, you can't approach Buster Rhymes. His security would stop you before you got even close to him. He doesn't take pictures. He's not friendly. <laughs> you know, if Bust you don't my know, guy. Bust yeah, my shout guy. out to Buster Rhymes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know he's mad at me about a couple of things right now. But <laughs> it is what it is. That's y'all business. <laughs> that's that's our business. Bust, yeah. I love No, and, and I fuck with Buster Rhymes. Yeah, no, too. That, you and, got and, to and if y'all was hanging yeah. out. Come on. But yeah, we, we'd be hanging out. And if you, now, if you do not know Buster Rhymes, you cannot walk up and shake his hand. Right. You can't even get close to him. Yeah. Um, but Nipsey was extremely approachable from what I heard. So you have the situation where this guy approached him and then, then you hear the stories that Nipsey allegedly called him a snitch and told him to, you know, to leave the area. Mm -hmm. Did you hear something kind of similar? I heard the same stories you heard, Vlad. Exactly. You know what I mean? And I wasn't there, so they just stories. They're just stories right you know now. What I mean? The trial hasn't happened. There's no plea deal. We're just all talking amongst ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's... That's really kind of like a downfall of celebrity in the hood when you make it. Because, okay, if you move out or if you're not around, then, oh yeah, he don't come through no more. You know what I'm saying? Nigga went Hollywood. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you do, you know, you can't do it with bodyguards and security all around you because, oh, look at this scary ass motherfucker. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, sitting over here floss. I don't know nobody gonna do nothing to you. But you got them old punk. They ain't gonna do shit anyway. Motherfucker right. slap the shit out of one of them motherfuckers. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that be the attitude then. But, you know, the, the keeping it real, you know, that's, that was the worst phrase that ever hit the urban community, I think, in yeah. the world. Yeah. I really do. I mean, Dave Chappelle, you made fun of it. Remember when Keeping It Real Goes Wrong? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Remember that? It was like, I, I remember hearing that. Oh, you never seen the skit? skit? It'd be like, yeah. It'd be I like, probably did, but I don't remember. It was a set of skits. You may have been locked up when, uh -huh. when, when, when this came out. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, but it was like, you know, some dude gets, you know, offhand comment and he just wilds out in the staff room and you know <laughs> punches his boss and now he's working at a gas station when yeah. keeping it real goes wrong like, right you know? <laughs> right that's hilarious that, that's how i love thing, dan yeah. chaffield jay but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah chaffield. keeping it real you said is the worst community it, it's, 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 it's the, the worst phrase that ever hit the urban community because mentally you attach that to i have to continue doing the same things i did before I became who I am now. Right. And that's a fallacy, you know? It's, 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 when you grow, your lifestyle has to change. It has to. You know, your priorities change. You know, your, 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 your surroundings change. Your, your, your associations and friendships even change. Your bills change. <laughs> Your burn rate changes. You have to make a lot more money every month to just maintain yes, you what do. you have around you. You're not. You're not. You don't have seven. You know, 
You don't have Section 8 housing where you pay a couple dollars a month and you can live there for free. Let, let, you, let me get them. Hey, the homie, slide me. The, I need like two Gs, homie. I'll get it back to you in like a month. Let me, I, you know, you you know how how many people can you, you know, you know and uh, homie, not right now. And let me get back at you. And then, you know, all this is breeding contempt. All this is breeding, you know, uh, uh, enmity towards you because people watching your pockets more than they watch their own. Everybody in the neighborhood knew that Nipsey Hussle was a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. Everybody. He talks about it in his music. Mm -hmm. He shows it. He showed his bank account on Instagram once. I remember he was talking about cryptocurrency and he showed his account and it was like a few hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was like, oh man, like this is, this is not a good idea. Right. You do not post your account information. This is you why know I, how social media is these oh, days man. with that age bracket. Oh yeah, this is why I never show my house, my car. I don't show like my watches, nothing like. For what? I might show a sneaker. Every well, I'm, so a, often I'm an artist, home. so you know we we show. <laughs> You're a little different, show, but, but yeah, yeah. But I, well, well, here's the thing: artists are not bragging about your success. Always has a cost. Yeah, it does. It does. You may not see that cost right away. Yeah. It's not right there at the register. It might not but manifest. It, it, it's, it's an IOU, <laughs> right? <laughs> which which will be cashed in, right? Whether it's you, you having know, to get somebody up off you, or, yeah, someone trying to extort you, mm -hmm. someone just mad at you, someone trying to hate on you, trying to fuck up some shit you're working on behind your back, talk bad about you, whatever. Right. Um, everybody in that neighborhood knew Nipsey Hussle was financially better off than they were. Right. And here he is in this neighborhood. And he thinks he's inspiring, but you're not inspiring everybody. You're, no. you're creating resentment as well. You, you are. Especially if you're not helping them. Yeah, especially. I, I remember I had a friend that I'd known for, whatever, 10 years. And when I started becoming successful, one day he called me up and said, Hey, man, uh, can, you, can you send me uh, 300 to, uh, you know, I, I want to go see my girl. And I'm like, man, you, you, you haven't paid me back from last money. <laughs> last time I lent you some money, he goes, man, I seen you spend a couple hundred on some bullshit, and you're not going to send it to me to help you out? That, that was the end of our relationship after that. I yeah. said, man, I'm cool. Yeah. You're not going to come at me like that. Not like, at all. You, you're, you're not going to start counting my money. For me. <laughs> yeah. Fuck out of here. You don't, you don't Telling me what I can shit. afford to give yeah. you. Yeah, fuck out of here. <laughs> fuck out of here with That's that That's hilarious. And, and he, he's never actually even apologized to me for that. He probably thinks he probably I'm, I'm, don't feel like he's wrong. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And this is what happens on a grander scale when you're a Nipsey Hustle on Crenshaw Slauson. It does. Everyone's looking at you like, damn, I wish I had that car. I wish I had those chains. I, I wish he'd let me hang out with him. I wish I can get in his entourage. Yeah. You know what I'm Maybe saying? Maybe he'll take I me wish, on tour. You know what I'm saying? You know, what I what what do I gotta do to, to be it's like the, you know, the uh what they call that at school, where the, where the cool kids sit, the cool table. Yeah, the cool table. <laughs> yeah, it's like being at the cool table. And if you're not at the cool table, it does breed resentment, you know, because, you know, you're doing everything you figure to be on that level and that status, but you just can't get a break from nowhere. And then right. you see that as your break. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone's break don't come through the same porthole. You know what I mean? Right. In Long Beach. Mm-hmm. If someone walked up and called you a snitch and said, get up out of here, I heard you're a snitch, what is the, what is the thought process that would go into someone like you if you were called that? Hmm. Well, if I knew the person and I knew somebody had put out some bad information on me or something like that, and I cared about the person on any level, then I'll probably take the time to, you know, hey, homie, check this out. I don't know why you believe in whatever you believe in that's going around, but this is what took place. And then I would explain the situation to clear my name. Now, if they don't know me, I know I've never had a snitch jacket because 95% of my cases have been alone. You know, and the ones that were with somebody else, we both went to jail, we did whatever <laughs> yeah. we did, and we both got out. I don't have none of that attached to my name at all. So I would probably laugh and just, you know, extricate myself from the situation real quick because I'm not, 
I'm not trying to even entertain no kind of nonsense like that. And I don't, you know, being that that's not my pedigree, if you coming at me like that, you obviously don't know me. And, you know, it's either some bait or some bullshit. So I'm not going to okay. entertain it. Well, explain to me how, you know, if you look at the insane Crips in Long Beach, mm -hmm. what happens when someone has a, snit, has a snitch jacket? Now, today, uh, you know, it, it can go from being ostracized, to, you know, to getting a welcome home party. I done heard all kind of way out stuff about people who, you know, who done told. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's three or four generations removed from when I was really active out there on the streets and enforcing the guidelines. So now they don't get enforced to the same degree as they did when I was on patrol, you know, when I was frontlining. So now, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. You know, you got snitches everywhere and people just acting like, well, you know, it wasn't me. So, you know, I'm just not gonna hang around them more. Some people still hang around them and be like, well, he didn't tell on me. So I ain't seen no paperwork, you know, but the guy who he told on is doing 40 years and you know, and he got out. So explain that. So yeah. I don't know really how it operates. Well, I mean, Eric Holder, AKA Shitty Cuz was 29 mm -hmm. years old. Well, is 29 years old. Um, you know, at 29, if someone had put a snitch jacket on you or just called you a snitch. I'm clearing my name. My first thing is clearing my name because when I came up, that's what it was all about. Your reputation. Okay. First and foremost, you couldn't really hide inside of a gang and, you yeah. know, and, and be anonymous seven, you know, from Insane Crip. You know, it was your name from Insane Crip. So you had to honor your name and stand on your name first and foremost. And then being that you was from Insane Crip, you had a heavier obligation to maintaining your name because now you got the set attached to your name. So, you know, you got to really, you know, show and prove because that's what we did. So my first, my first move would be to clear my name. Okay. And if, and if I was guilty of telling whatever, I would I would I shake the spot. I just go somewhere else. I go to you know Minnesota and you know right. start to you know start the Minnesota Lokes or, or something <laughs> like that. You know and be the king out there or something. You know, but nobody never know about Long Beach. Well, I mean, I was talking to one of my OG uh, OG homies, um, and this was a private conversation, so I'm not gonna say who it is, but he told me that. Uh, a snitch jacket is considered the ultimate disrespect. Yes, it is. That it's, you call someone a snitch, it's one of the most insulting things that you could say to somebody in that environment. Yeah, it is. It is. Because all you have, you know, Scarface said it on the movie. All, balls all in your word. My balls in my word. That's it. That's all you got in the hood. You know what I mean? You don't, don't nobody else got nothing to go on. You know what? What's his resume? You know, has he ran out? You know, uh, you know, have you ever been to jail? Or have you ever been under pressure? What did he do? Oh, well, they said he did what? Oh, we need to get to the bottom of that. And that's, that's usually how it works. But now, you know, you have some snitches that know how to make money good. So people excuse the fact that they snitching because, you know, that helps their lifestyle be supported you know like well i don't you know i'm not really i'm not really down with snitches and all that but shit if this fool breaking me off you know why not get broke off and a lot of people make concessions and justifications just to fit their own understanding instead of adhering to what the code says you know and you should know the code if you're a gangster you know snitches get snitches you know, and they, you know, it's, they, they're never welcome in any circle. I said that on the first song I did with Snoop Dogg, 21 Jump Street. Mm. No snitches allowed inside the crowd. That was, my, <laughs> that was one of my first bars on wax in about 1994, I think. So, yeah, yeah, that's still standing on it. Still standing on that No same. snitches, don't hang with nobody. They hang with snitches, don't want to hang with them. You know, uh, y'all keep that over there. Well. 
I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens once the news, you know, once the story comes out. Uh, I heard that Eric Holder is trying to uh, shop an interview. You know, I mean. I'm, I, I still would like to know how you got Christopher Darden so fast. That was kind of crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I wonder, could, could we find out who footed that bill? Or was it a pro bono move for Darden to get the spotlight again? I, I think it was pro bono. I don't think that. Yeah. For, I don't think that for, a for, dude for named the, Shitty <laughs> Cuz could afford a murder trial. <laughs> you know, to pay someone for a murder trial. Thanks. I think that Thanks. you know that that'll that could easily cost you a hundred thousand or more. Yeah. Easily. If it goes to trial, that's about the base rate. The base rate of a yeah. murder trial. Yeah. Good luck with that when you probably don't even have a car. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. When you got a getaway driver that's a girl. Like, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think he's just trying to get back in the, in the spotlight. That's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he, I think uh, Dia Hughley uh, in our last interview said that Chris Darden's always been on the opposite side of black people. Really? Always. Like, it, well, I should say always, but in that trial, he was on the opposite side of, the side of black people. In this trial, he's on the opposite side of black people. So I don't, maybe his timing's off. <laughs> oh, he's a shitty beard wish player. I don't know, but, but I, but I, listen, he's an advocate. He's a lawyer. I don't think it means, I don't think that there has to be some kind of conspiracy to see a lawyer take a case that is high profile and that, that, that seems he's not gonna win. No, I of mean. course he knows he's not gonna win, but he's gonna be hurt. Like Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Just like Clarence Thomas. On okay. the opposite side on first the OJ case, now now the uh, the Eric Holder case. Yeah. Um Yeah, he could he could have received mob justice. They should have let mob justice say, right, we got him over here, and you know what I mean? And, and he surrounded and just let the people deal with it. Yeah, you know, and I've heard a lot of rumors about family members, something happening to some of his family members mm. and a mother's house and stuff like that. But I've never reported on any of it because it was all rumors. Yeah. It really. may have happened. It may have not have happened. I don't know. Right, right. I have no idea. And you hope it didn't happen. You hope it didn't because, happen. Yeah, what does someone's cousin or mother have to do with you, you dig where I'm coming from? With that dumb shit that he did. Yeah. You know, his yeah. mother didn't he, put him up to it. He didn't go <laughs> run it by Auntie Betty or nothing, you know. Like, yeah. look, I'm thinking about, you know, so yeah, why include them? You know. But it's the pain. You know, you understand it's the pain and the wanting to lash out and retaliate and all that, but people gotta start choosing that, you know, the right well, I mean, he was ultimately the right targets, man. Yeah, I mean, he was ultimately caught, I guess, at a in a mental institution. He like checked himself into a mental institution. So, uh, I think that he was probably trying to hide in a mental institution. I mean, we're gonna come looking for you in the main, looking for you on the streets. They're not looking for you to be committed nowhere because you're supposed to be on the streets, ducking and running and hiding and you know, trying to find shelter somewhere. I mean, the whole world knows what you look like and they're all on the lookout. You know what I'm saying? You got neck tattoos and... You wouldn't think nobody in the mental hospital would probably connect that. Well, either that or maybe, you know, because I'd heard the story was that he, he had been in and out of mental institutions already, that maybe he's going to try to do the insanity plea, like, I didn't know what, I didn't take my medication. You know, because does California still have the death penalty? Not, not Gavin Newsom put a moratorium on it. Aha. Okay, yeah. but it had the death penalty since like 2000, no, sorry, 1970 something. 1970. 70. They had executed like 13 people, Tukey Williams being one of them. That was in 2004 or 5. Okay. Yeah, that was 2000. That was 2005, matter of fact, or 6. Yeah. I was in, um, I was in, um, Selena's Valley with his son at the time, with Tookie's son. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. sad. Locked all the crypts down in prison and all that. I think I think I'd met one of his sons. Perhaps from yeah. Watts. Dark skinned dude. I remember it was just at a, some little event. We we were talking, and he was mm -hmm. saying how people like to call him Little Tookie, and he was like, "Nah, that's my dad's thing. That's not right. me. I'm not trying to take on those <laughs> those reins, like." Right, right, right. You know, I went to school. Big and, shows to fail. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they finally caught him. 
So he's not facing the death penalty, but he's definitely facing life. Because not only did you kill one person, you shot two other people. And we actually interviewed Kerry Lathan, mm -hmm. who was the person who got seriously shot. Mm -hmm. I guess the other guy that was Kerry's nephew got shot in the belt buckle, and it kind of just yeah. didn't really do nothing. Lucky him. Very lucky. Yeah. But when Kerry got shot, I guess it chipped his spine, mm. and he's now in a, well, he's in a wheelchair trying to recover, and then they violated his probation. They tried to violate his probation mm -hmm. and sent him back to jail. He had done 26 years for murder. Right. And he had gotten out seven months ago. Mm -hmm. He was there at the store to just get a, like a nice t-shirt. Right. And then he just, all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. I think I might know him. Oh, really? Yeah, I think, I think we might have, uh, we might have crossed paths in the system sometime back. Uh, because I know a cousin, Carrie. And okay. I don't know if it's little or big. Quite obviously, 26 years later, I didn't met people in <laughs> Sweden and you know Japan and all every yeah. state in the nation. So, you know, faces I still kind of remember faces. And when I saw him, his face didn't really register. But I definitely know it's either him or his little homeboy. Okay. Well, I did an interview with him. Big U actually set it up. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I heard the story, I'm like, I gotta at least put this on my platform to get this the story out. So we interviewed him. And, uh, you know, we put a link to a GoFundMe page. We raised something like $18,000. That was dope. And then a couple of days later, uh, we found out that the charges were being dropped against him. Great. So either he's out already or he's about to come so out. So what happened? The money went back to the people that donated? No, I think he gets the money, hopefully. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's really cool right Yeah, there. yeah. Because, you know, I mean, he's seven months out. Yeah. But it, it really says a lot over this situation because he was violated for associating with a known gang member. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about in the interview about what do you do when you've been in prison for a long period of time and you go back to the neighborhood where your family is, the only people you know, and they're all kind of gang related in their own way. Right. And you automatically violate. Yeah. Essentially for just being there. Yeah. Have you seen this type of uh, violation before? Yeah. So yeah. this is common. Yeah, they certain brothers can't even live in the same house together. Really? Yeah, they'll tell one brother, you can't parole there. You have to find somewhere else to parole because your brother's parole there and, you know, can't have both of y'all in the same house. So he'd have to find a uncle or, you know, some female to go live with or something uh -huh. like that. So, yeah, so they won't even let certain brothers in the same house together. So, yeah, this is very familiar. And how do you really know the gang affiliation of everyone you're around? You see what I'm saying? Like you get pulled over in a car, one guy happens to if be... If y'all from the same gang, that's where the injunction comes in. Oh, so it could be a different gang and it won't matter? Well, no, it would matter depending on what y'all was doing. And if you had knowledge that this was a gang member, if you were assumed to have knowledge that this person was a gang member, that this other person you was dealing with. Okay. And that's up to the determination. See, it's, it's very tricky. That's up to the determination of the board. Well, wait a minute. How do you know him? Oh, that's my cousin. Oh, your cousin. You know, you know if he gang bang or not. You know. Well, how do you know him? Oh, um, he was. I was just getting a ride from him. You know, that's his. That's my girlfriend's friends. Whatever, whatever. And okay. then they check all that and be like, oh, okay. Well, story matches up. He probably didn't know he was from a gang and he'll probably get some leniency. But if you're from the same gang, they automatically expect you to know each other. Not, not the fact that you might be 55 and he might be 19, you know what I mean? And you, you know, right. you, or, or he's, you know, 32 and he's 47. Well, you no, guys are, Carrie, you're from the same gang. So you, it's a given yeah. that you two know each other. Well, Carrie is 56 and Nipsey was 33, so. They didn't know each other before. He kind of broke down the story. He basically said, I know him just in passing. You know what I mean? We took a selfie together because he's a, a rap star. Like, we don't hang out. Because the story was like, oh, Nipsey went to the store to help his friend out who had just gotten out. Like, nah, it wasn't like that. He was already there, and the guy just randomly stops by. Mm -hmm. And then, boom, all hell breaks loose, and he gets shot. And then he's back in jail without, you know, in a bad medical state. 
Right. He, they're not giving him medicine or whatever else, and he's fucked up. Oh, woo. So, you know. I've seen gunshot victims in the county yeah. jail. It's Awful. Fucked, fucked up. Awful. So they gave him some Tylenol and said, go ahead. Yeah. So well, I got what, shot. What they <laughs> Tylenol ain't doing shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're going to get that 400, that, that <laughs> Tylenol for the most potent thing they're going to give you up in there. And, yeah, deal with it. Well, Kerry got out. Good. And uh, hopefully the GoFundMe money goes to him. So he has yeah, a little true, bit of startup money to kind of get his life together. True and, um, you know, people like to always say that people get locked up after a Vlad TV interview. But here's a Vlad TV interview that actually helps someone get out. <laughs> you ain't going to get no credit. No, I'm not. They not. That's okay. They, they, no, no acknowledgement, none nah, of that. Nah. None. Oh, he knew the police. So, yeah, he, yeah, he, he, just, did it. he just did it to say he got... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish I could get someone out. I wish yeah. I knew the police oh, that well. And while you mention that, shout out to, I got to give T.I. a shout out because uh, yesterday, um, which was uh, Easter. The, yeah, Easter. He, 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 um, he went and bailed out like 20, 20, 23, 23 people. Yeah, nonviolent offenders or whatever, nice. whatever. Hey, I, that's love. Yeah, he, he worked with the church to, to help him that help him bail out. Dope. That was just the thought of doing that. You yeah, know so what all I mean? these all these men could be at home with their families for yeah. Easter. Yeah, yeah. Shout out, you know, and then shout out to you though, man, for really getting involved in that. Cause you didn't have to. You know what I mean? No, man. I hit Big U out of the blue and was like, "Hey, uh, man, this is fucked up. Yeah. Can you can you set up an interview?" And then you called me back later that day, and he had him on the phone. Right. And I'm like, okay, well, hold on, let me let me record this real quick, yeah. and like, let me let me scramble and, and make this happen. And right. Yeah, we we did it, got it out quickly. Shout out to Big U too, man. Yeah. He, he's tired. He's tirelessly involved in uniting um, some of the most vicious gangs in LA right now. Hopefully, all will come aboard eventually. But the main rivals right now. They interacting and, and 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 talking and you know really trying to come to a to a resolution for you know all the chaos that's been caused in the streets over the years and and make it better for their kids and you know things like that their kids kids and things like that because uh, pretty much whatever you didn't did right now it's gonna catch up with you if you don't catch up with you here you know you talk to God about it but. You know, it's, it's a good thing for somebody really to be taking that interest and carrying that banner on for Nip because, you know, he, he, was, a, he was a very empowering um, lyricist. Big U had the, the gang peace march, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I remember when Big U was here, we talked about the rolling 60s A-Trey gangster, you know, war. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd have to call it that. He would. Uh, that had been going on for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. And... You know, the the start of it is kind of fuzzy. We talked about it a little bit. I guess someone got killed and, you know, that sort of started to kind of escalate. There was a war that was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, you know, you, you always hear about the the war with the a tray that goes back like 30 years. Right. And I read about the, the origins of that, of that whole beef. Mm -hmm. And I guess a fight happened, someone got killed and... The other side wanted payback, and that didn't happen. And then, thirties or forty years now, that's been happening. Yeah, it's um. <laughs> You're talking about multi generational, well, over forty years, multi generational beef mm -hmm. that started with someone that people probably have never even met. At the, right. You know, didn't didn't even know these days. Have no idea who that is, and so forth. You're talking about forty years ago. You know. You're fighting someone over a situation you probably don't even know any of the people involved in. No. You know, you're not sure, but you're, you know, you're referring to this person as an enemy. That you're not totally sure why they're an enemy, but mm -hmm. you know, your big homie said that's an enemy, so that's your enemy. And you don't like this hat. You don't yeah, like that <laughs> this color. area. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, this so. area where all these people are renting homes. <laughs> Just like you're renting homes in your own area, no one owns nothing, mm -hmm. but you don't like those renters over there. You know, you see how crazy it sounds once you start saying it out loud?
Yeah. And but but Big U actually got these guys together talking. I saw the video of it. I'm like, this is this is pretty big for L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because like we had mentioned before, that Rolling Sixties A Trey Gangster War, he said separated the gangs of L.A. Crippen started in sixty in sixty nine. This is when they say the C was born. Mm -hmm. The C was born in sixty nine, but in seventy nine the C was was split up, and. More than it's more than it was a beef with the Rolling Sixties and the A Trey Gangsters, it split up L.A. Yeah, like when when the Rolling Sixties and the A Trey Gangsters started fighting, it split it split L.A. in half. Right, because was that the first time that there was like a Crip on Crip that war? Was the first time Before then, it was just Crips Bloods, but this is the Crips first blood, time that right. inner Crip. War and it really out. and really, uh, um, to my knowledge, it probably hadn't even been like three, four murders or three, four, you know. Um, really killings at all between Crips and Blood between Crips and Bloods up until 79. Well, Bloods kind of like filtered into it from personal allegiances with individuals and then yeah. they would hang out in each other's hoods and you know they would kind of like be cool with different games but they they weren't a part of it. It was like you know the side switch with you know, you either went with the gangsters or the neighborhoods. That's pretty much how it went if you were an L.A. gang. Was know. was uh, the Insane Crips part of any of that? Not at all. We from Long Beach. So, so you guys, say that's, no, that's y'all. Long Beach. We, yeah. <laughs> y'all go, we, go. Yeah, we, 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 yeah. And that's why I give them props and shout them out for what they doing right now, you know, because they got to get themselves together. You know what I mean? It got to start from within. It got, you know, can't no celebrity or you know, athlete or actor or nothing come in and put this together, they have to want to do it and they want to do it. They've been wanting to do it for a long time because, you know, who don't want to have fun and laugh and barbecue and all that, you know, so yeah. now that they taking, you know, now they taking effective action and making it happen, I salute that, I applaud that, you know, and, you know, we got some things down in Long Beach that we need to tighten up on and, you know, God willing, we'll get to that real soon. Well, you know, I mean, I know my personal experience, you know, for everyone that's, you know, and I, I'm not from that gang life at all, but yeah. I think that both sides, if they really took one moment and said, part of the reason why I have a problem with this other set is from shit that they did themselves as well. You know what I mean? No one has their hands completely clean in this situation. Mm -hmm. Start thinking where, what the mistakes you've made and that'll make you less angry at what the other side did as well. You see what I'm saying? It's like kind of self-healing. Self-healing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I went through some of that myself recently, and it really helped out with people that I hated for many years, some of which aren't even alive. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> Everyone hates somebody. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, the look, the look was like <laughs> you thought about it. Like, I thought about <laughs> it for a second. Like, yeah. You know, Suge Knight commented on this situation mm -hmm. you know, from prison. He said that uh, Nipsey's loyalty to his hood got him murdered. Do you agree? Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. it did. It did, you know. There's no other way to see it. You know, because um, if he would have operated on the level that he was actually ascending to, he would have become more exclusive. He would he would have become more exclusive because he would have really recognized his value alive. You know, I mean, when you're in that mind frame like this to set. Man, when I was 33, I was right there where he was at, you know. And I was about five years in the game, six years in the rap game. You know, I had been on a few albums. Uh, you know, was known, I was already known before I became known as a rapper, right. and that just added extra notoriety. So, so, you, so you were hanging out in Long Beach at 33? Long Beach, Compton, L.A., you know, stopping Watts, you know, yeah, all that, all that, daily, daily, that was my thing, you know. And what, what were some was, of the negative things that happened from you doing that? Hmm. I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was a few negative things that happened, but 
you know, really nothing that wasn't expected. You know, I never right. got chased out of <laughs> nobody hood and yeah. shot at just for coming over there to deal with nobody or nothing like that. So that that was never a result. Well, like I just interviewed Bosco, mm -hmm. right? Who was from uh, Inglewood, wow. uh, Queen Street. Bosco 100. Bosco 100, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, I said, what would happen if you spent a whole week in your neighborhood just hanging out in the corner every day? He says something violent would happen. I guarantee something gonna happen. Something violent. Something violent. Something gonna happen. I guarantee. It's that like, bad. I guarantee, like I'm 100% sure, guarantee. Give me an example of something that might happen. Just, you got like, I mean, you got haters. Like you got, you might have some broke bum ass nigga that just feel like, shit, this nigga Bosco got a big ass chain. He popping fucking, I'm gonna rob this nigga, kill him for his chain. Like you might got a nigga that feel like that. Or you might got a nigga that feel like, man, fuck that. This nigga, this nigga still a blood to me. Fuck it, I'm a crip, nigga. Fuck bloods. You feel me? Kill me on that. Or you might got an essay that just feel like, you know, fuck these black fools. Like, fools. Like, you know, it, it could be anything. You might got a police officer that feel like, uh, this nigga think he got away from us. And you know what I mean? He think he made it out the hood. Man, fuck this nigga. You know, anything can happen. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, he trying to, you know what I mean? Hit me with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, you know what I mean? With the put your hands up thing. You know? Bosco invite that kind of energy though. So, you know, it, it's just, I like him. He's hilarious. Yeah, he you is. know what I'm saying? I, I just watched some of his stuff maybe a month, month ago, month, <laughs> five, six weeks ago. And I said, man, this guy's really nuts. And then he had me laughing like a bro. So, but he, but he, he invites that kind of energy because it's gonna be some shit going on wherever he at, right. you know. But truthfully, I believe anybody, nobody of merit really can, you know, because it's like you not, you really not one of us no more. That's true. You know what you doing here? You you're should not, you're be not, doing this. Yeah, you're you? not in the same struggle anymore. If I was you, I would be, you know on an iceberg with, with a supermodel getting my dick sucked right now. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, what, what you doing in the hood, you know? So it's like you'll never be able to please everybody in the hood, ever, no matter what you do. I mean, you can come hand out money and, you know, some, some people ain't going to get enough money or they not going to feel they got. Oh, what? Oh, this fool just giving $25 out. <laughs> you you yeah. feel me? It's, it, you can't satisfy the hood. You can't satisfy nobody. It ain't just the hood. You will never satisfy the entire population. You right. know, people don't like Jesus to this day. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, I interviewed Malik Yoba recently. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he had run into Tupac and stuff like that. Right. He said something interesting. A lot of people got upset, but I think it's an interesting point. He said that Tupac talked a lot about what we need to do for the community. And obviously with his mother, Afeni, who was a, a panther and, you know, by extension, the breakfast programs, education programs, all that kind of stuff that he was steeped in, he spoke to those things. But Nipsey was actually doing those things. The interesting thing about him is that he wasn't on everybody's radar like that. Right, and I think that it's the 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 tragedy cracked open the truth of what dude was really doing, and that's what fucks people up because you realize, man, this dude was really doing it. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? I think Tupac did help the community. I think he helped the community mentally. Very true. You know. Stand up. Don't be no punk. Don't go for no shit. Be proud you black. You come from kings and queens. You know, uh, um, you know, just just strength, power, courage, love. You know, he 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 covered all the spectrums, you know, and me having a Gemini wife, you know what I'm saying? I kind of understand the dual Gemini personality, you know what I mean? And he embodied that. You know, and, and his his music, his music would compel you to move differently and think differently. Mm -hmm. So well, I, I give him that. Tupac was 25, Nipsey was 33. Right. And Tupac wasn't getting all the money he was supposed to be getting either. Right. But 
I, I think that ultimately Tupac was to me, you know, from my point of view, not knowing Tupac, but, you know, interviewing people around him and slightly knowing Nipsey and knowing people around him. Mm -hmm. My point of view is Tupac was more of a, just kind of a pure artist, not really a business person. When Tupac died, he had like 5,000 in his bank account, mm -hmm. you know, and none of the cars were in his name and his, you know, his mother probably had, had a fight. Had probably a fight. had four or five hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry, though. Yeah, and, right. Oh, uh, yeah. And then, you know, his mother had to go clean up his, his con you know, sue and get the rights back and everything else like that. Tupac was focused on his music. Yeah. And that's it. He was an artist. He was, he a, was a pure artist. True. Everything else was kind of falling in shambles as long as he could do his music. He, he made enough money to keep it going. Nipsey was more of a business person. Mm-hmm. And an artist as well, but he had to juggle his time running multiple businesses and, and stuff like that. But he learned, you don't think he learned from the lesson from Tupac? Absolutely. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. It, as you know, as time progresses, you would look back and be like, I'm not going to do that. Okay, boom. People feeling me like this, so let me make sure I'm cool right here. You know, and you know, you, you, start, you start really just like, uh, putting up defenses to safeguard yourself from yeah. running into the same problems of other artists of note may have, you know, levels of success they might have reached and they might not have conducted themselves yeah. in a certain capacity. So it, I don't think any one is worse than the other or better than the other or whatever else. Some people want to run businesses and deal with the headaches that come with running businesses. Other people just want to focus on their art and let someone else handle the business part. But you do you think do you believe if Tupac had had the opportunity really because he was fresh out of prison. You know what I'm saying? He had been out of prison what? 2 years before that happened. You feel me? Yeah. So he never really got planted in a community to, in a community to hmm. really feel for a community like that. Okay. Yeah, and he moved from Oakland to LA. He was sort of all over the place. Yeah, and from he, Baltimore and, and, and uh, yeah, he, he was all over the place. You did. So You're right. He wasn't Nipsey was from Rolling 60s. That's why his he, whole life he knew the ins and the outs. He knew all the people. You're right. Tupac That's why you see the yeah. effect of the mm. love radiating like that. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It was like we lost one of us. You know what I'm saying? He's really run one of us that made it from where we strive to make it from. He really, really made it. And they, you know, he, he gave the youth a lot of inspiration, you know, to follow. Yeah. I mean, people are comparing Nipsey to Jesus. I'm not mad. Yeah. Jesus was a prophet. Yeah. Even when you look at the paintings, the way Nipsey's now being painted in murals, it looks, they're making him look a little like Jesus now. And you know what his name meant, right? What was that? Uh, sent by God. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, Hermias. Hermias, yeah, yeah, that is his real name. Yeah. You know, uh, me and D.L. Hughley, we talked about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. D.L. actually used to be a blood. Okay. You know, I know something about DL. Yeah. I just felt like <laughs> I love DL though. DL, DL, one of my favorite. Yeah. One of my favorite I watch guests. his show too. I watch his show yeah, on TV, TV one. one now. Yeah, yeah man. Real. Yeah, yeah go tune into that, man. I watched the dope one show, with him great and Matt guests. Barnes and uh, Barnes, Steve Harvey, uh, George Lopez. George Lopez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I get down with DL. Um, you know, he said something interesting. He said that when I grew up, it, I wanted to be like the dude that shot Nipsey. I thought that was the greatest thing ever. Eric Holder. To, to put in work for your set. I thought that was dope. Yeah, although I don't know whether he was really put, putting in but I'm just work saying, for if you, to, to, in that situation. But, but I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. But, but to, to, to have the idea that the destruction of things was better than the building of it. Mm, yeah. But now all of a sudden you have a young man who died, who showed you that living your life, even though it was short, in a way of... When, I've never seen black men, a young black man like that in my life, celebrated for his service to people. But you can't regret in a grown mind frame things you felt as an impressionable youth growing up in the gangbang capital of the United States. Hmm. You can't hold yourself accountable for, for how you thought then because you really had no plan for life. 
you know, every day was okay. I'm going out here with my red or my blue rag, you know, whoever I encounter, I got my pistol on me and I'm either get another stripe or it, it might be my day. You know, so that was your whole, that was your whole ambition was to survive the day, you know, and whatever, you know, transpired throughout, throughout, you know, it was, it was all love, you know, the, you know, the getting high and, the, you know, going and hanging out and the partying and, you know, going who riding and all that. That was, that was just the fun of it. But it was really like, man, you know, it, you putting on your uniform every day to go to work. Yeah, man. I mean, one of the other things that he said was that uh, every single person, we celebrate Jesus. Who killed him? We celebrate Caesar. Who killed him? His own people? His own people. A prophet has no honor amongst his own. Shit, you can look at Malcolm X you can. and the Nation of Islam. You know, um, you know, we don't know the exact details of it, but the guys who got convicted of the murder were NOI. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, Malcolm X had turned his back on the NOI, and they had a falling out. And uh, it's a great know. chapter in history. You know what I'm saying? Everybody yeah. should read that Malcolm X book. Yeah, autobiography, of Malcolm X. Yeah, by, by everybody Alex should read that. Um, You know, and you look at Nipsey; he was killed by a roll in the '60s. Mm -hmm. May not have been the exact same set, but this was somebody that. Felt. It's only one set. It's just different divisions. Okay, right. Sorry, yeah. my bad. Yeah. Well, you know, this was someone that was able to walk up to him and get close enough to him to actually kill him. Mm -hmm. This was not an outsider. This was not a, an enemy, a known enemy. This was someone that was considered part of the community. Right. And, um, you know, I talked to some people around Nipsey, and they were like, yeah, we, we know this guy. We know who, you know, this guy is a known guy you know what i mean he's not just you know we know about his reputation and stuff like that so and he should have been exterminated hmm. he should have been and that's the problem why when you asked me that question i really couldn't answer and i'm not going to sit up here and you know uh falsify the status of my hood like we yeah. just you know extra on top of, you know, RG code, you know, oh, uh, you know, they get laid out on, on, on the spot, you know, people let people let people like that linger, you know, because they're known to be shooters or, or things like that. And like, you yeah. know what, I just don't want no part of that. I'm gonna let him, I'm not gonna mess with him, but I'm not gonna mess with him, you know, and that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong approach. Yeah. Yeah, man, because... That's the wrong approach, man. He was never supposed to be able to get that close to me. Well, man. not only was he not supposed to be able... You know, because he, here's the thing. If you look at this situation, and like I said, let's just assume that Nipsey called him a snitch and that's what, what triggered the chain of events. Mm -hmm. Had he walked up to Nipsey and Nipsey knew who he was and be like, oh, yeah, what up, homie? Hey, man, hey, man I'm a little busy right now, but I'm going to holler at you later. And had one of his guys go to the guy and say, hey, man, listen, you're going to have to leave up out of here. Uh, you know. That would have been a much better way to handle it. I don't think anything would have happened right. at that point. He would have walked away. And he knew the guy telling him was probably security, probably armed. He would have been thinking twice about coming back. And if he came back, that guy would have been ready for him to come back. And he would have came back for him. For him. Yeah. Not for Nipsey, because Nipsey never insulted him exactly. in, that, in that situation. Um, and you have to know, you have to know how to... You have to know how to play that balance. You know what I mean? You you know, you, especially being someone of a celebrity status, someone automatically gonna look at you when you tell them anything street related or something like that. It's like, fool, I'm down here every day. You you know, you you ain't gotta be down here. You can't tell me nothing. You know, and it's like if that came from somebody else that they knew who was out there moving around the same streets they was moving around when they was moving around and be like, oh yeah, let me go on and slide off. You know what I'm saying? This ain't cool because I know how this gonna turn out. You know, it's like, right. hold on, homie, you, 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 you rap, so I'm not, I'm not worrying about you drawing down on me and knocking me down because you're not finna risk everything you got like that. So why is you pushing the line on me like that? So you know, he probably felt extra 
insulted because it's like everybody else letting coexist. How, how you don't even have to be here and you telling me I can't be here. Yeah, so. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the Tupac situation a little bit. You know, when you have a situation where somebody gets a level of insult, not just from a fellow gang member, but from a rapper, a celebrity, which, which stings, stings a lot Same more. Parallel. It brings the, the embarrassment to the insult. Mm-hmm. And it, it escalates the feelings of anger. You know, and I remember when I talked to Big U, and we talked about how... You know, in 2019, you have cameras, you have surveillance, you have cell phones, and, and when you do crimes, it's, you're much more likely to get caught. So has that really, you know, decreased the gangbang? And Big U looked at me straight in the face and said, That don't stop people. I mean, You don't think you, it slows people down a little bit? When you mad, you mad. Yeah. If you, if you, if you upset, and you 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 on your thing. You you mad because you going. Yeah. Now it may stop that dude who's not really serious about it, but it's not gonna stop somebody who, if they going, they going, and they really ain't caring in that moment about no cameras. And I've seen it happen. Yeah. It's very chilling, but that's basically it. Once you get angry, I don't give a fuck if there's a camera right there. Facts. Don't care if there's twenty people around. Yeah. I'm going to try to shoot all of them. How's that? Because that's basically what it looked like. Look, like he was trying to kill everybody. Mm. Shot three people. Yeah. Then came back. I guess he came back like twice. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah, nobody returned fire. Because, you know, you, you would, I mean, you don't know what, what would have happened, but had he shot once and then somebody pulled out a gun or, or something like that, and there was, it was now dangerous, was he wouldn't be able the, to, you know, Nipsey might still be alive today. It was, it was just, it was just the, everything was perfect for that to happen the yeah. way it did. You know, just from the lack of retaliation and everything, it was like it was, it was ordained, man, it was preordained. You know, God don't make no mistakes, I'm a firm believer of that. So, you know, he took him at the opportune moment where you know, he could leave the best impact down here. And at the same time, you know, he was he was doing a lot of good things. So that was probably a good time for him to exit on a, on a high note. He had a hell of a funeral. He did. Had a hell of a funeral. He did. He did. Um, you know, the sold out the, the first celebrity. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Well, to sell out the Staples Center since Michael Jackson. Yeah, he sold it out in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. All tickets were sold in 10 minutes. Well, they were free tickets, but they were all... Well, they were yeah. gone. They, <laughs> they were, were gone, They yeah. were called in and they were filled. And then the procession was for like 25 miles, went through his old neighborhood and, and everything else like that. Yeah, um, yeah man, uh, an incredible way to go out, you know, to see, to have your family experience all that love, but... His mom's was just so calm. Oh, that. yeah. She was just so calm and spread it just so much tranquility and love and and spiritual awareness. You really after after watching her, you really couldn't even be, you know, you couldn't be incensed like you was. Yeah. At first it was like you had to see it for what it was, like she was prepared. You know, and just it wasn't like he was on the a wild collision course like getting into stuff like Takashi, you know what I mean? Like every yeah. every week you hearing something new about him involved in but you know, she just it was just in her spirit. So, you know. Well, I mean Nipsey was, you know, very active when he was younger. Mm -hmm. You know, as well as his brother. His brother had just got out of out of prison, I think, somewhat recently. I think that as a mother you have to come to grips at one point. I mean, seeing probably all the other mothers in the area go through losing their children, True. losing their sons. True. You have to mentally prepare yourself to a certain degree. You can't just live in total denial for 33 years and think like, you know, God is protecting my son and nothing bullets will bounce off of him and stuff like that. You know that there is a possibility of this mm -hmm. and you have, you know, you, you spend years preparing until it finally happens and you say, okay, well, Unfortunately, this, this is what happened, and 
hopefully this won't happen to my other kids yeah. as well because he has a brother and I think a sister as well. Yeah. And now there's grandkids as well, man. Very, very sad, man. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to have interviewed him and, you know, that Vlad TV could be part of his story overall, like mm-hmm. document a piece of his story. We got a great spirit too. You met him. I know you yeah. would agree he had a great yeah. spirit. I have listen, man, I it's always the, the, the image that's been portrayed was my experiences with Nipsey every time. Mm-hmm. From our interviews to our just running into each other, always polite, always nice, never any animosity, never mm-hmm. you know, we were actually we actually planned to do another interview. Right. We were t- we were tweeting each other back and forth publicly and he was like, Yeah, man, let's do it, but just no negativity, you know, you're a you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, he was like, no, you're a free journalist. Face it. Yeah, he's yeah, free face yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Because I was right. covering his, like, he had, like, this, like, STEM center thing, like, this this community project center 90. project. Yeah. V something, I forgot. Mm-hmm. And, v90. You know, we, yeah, V90. And, you know, mm-hmm. me and him were talking about, you know, I'd been covering that, and he had been retweeting it, and me mm-hmm. and him were kind of trying to do some shit. It never happened, unfortunately, but... Um, like I said, I had one interview with him. I'm, I'm glad to have gotten that, and yeah. that's going to live on forever. Yeah, I performed with him on stage, so that was yeah. yeah that's going to be a memory embedded in my mind too. At the same time, um, you know, I would I would have loved to get do a song with him, just like you know some OG little homie kind of stuff. Right. And that never came to fruition, mm-hmm. but just the fact that you know we were scheduled to do it and it didn't take place, but you know, him embracing me and Goldie Loke like that, mm. you know, it was it, it was it was a real warm feeling, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Because we was there, we pulled up, and, you know, we was around him and all his homies, his whole crew, you know, and yeah. they do what they do, you know, and it was it was all love. Yeah, man. So, yeah, man, we gonna miss him. Well, uh, YNW uh, Melly, who was uh, facing killing his two, I guess, best friends, Mm-hmm. They just announced that uh, Florida is going to be seeking the death penalty. Uh, unlike California, Florida has absolutely no problems killing people. Oh, they don't. <laughs> they don't. You just you just posted something about the police whooping on somebody out there. Yeah. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, man. I mean, if you just Google Florida, man, you will see just the craziest shit yeah. ever. Yeah. You know, Florida, man, you know, gets released <laughs> from prison and... Steals a car in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Florida man yeah. runs in convenience store with an alligator. Like <laughs> Florida man, <Damn> it. Uh, <laughs> you know, like it's it's always Florida man yeah. that's always fucking some shit up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, he's now facing the death penalty. And and his song "Murder on My Mind" is like a top charting song now. People crazy. Yeah, yeah. People really is macabre. That's real. Um, well, the, the death penalty was around. So when did they stop doing the death penalty? When did they put the moratorium on it? Uh, was it, it could have been this year. I think it was just a couple months ago. Okay. Yeah, Gavin Newsom, the, the, the uh, governor. Okay. So when you were in prison, the death penalty was still around. Yeah. Uh, you had never been on death row, though. Thank God. Thank God. No. So do they either ever... the record label or the or the <laughs> tier in prison? Okay. Is death row just a completely different section of the prison? How, how does it work? I think it's a tier. I think it's a a building like the condemned row. It's it's condemned row, and you know when when they move. You know, you have to turn around, face the wall, and, huh. you know, it's no movement in certain areas where they bring them, you know, whether they go on to visits or attorney visits and stuff like that, and they, they're they heavily guarded. You know, I got a couple homies on death row. Okay, and it's because when you're on death row, they can't really punish you any worse, so people just don't give a fuck. Not give you your yard, what they're not going to give you, your hour on the yard three times a week or whatever it is. Yeah, I don't like it with damn. You know. So you had friends on death row? Yeah, I got a couple. Could you have communicated with them or no communication once you're on death row? Well, one of them I used to communicate with and uh you know, he was doing his thing in there, you know, he just like anybody else in the prison, you know, they gonna have a weed, they gonna have a phone, they gonna okay. have whatever, you know, it's like you know, if you can slide up under free staff or guard, you know, you got action at being one of the 
you know, one of the guys up in there, okay. you know, that, that got, uh, got the little extra shit you ain't Right, but in have. terms of the, the way the rules are set up, you know, if you're on death row, do you get phone calls? Do you get visits? I think visits? you might get a phone call every month. Yeah, you might. You, I mean, you, you get phone calls, like monthly phone calls. That's okay. how they used to do it. And then I'm sure they get visits. They even have uh, something set up, I believe, where they automatically get to order, like, food packages and cosmetic packages and stuff like that. I think it's a fund for them up there. Huh. So, you know, they can sustain life on death row. You know, I remember I interviewed Boosie. And he was on death row. He was facing a needle. He was on death row? He was actually? on death row. From the county jail to the prison death row? Or was he fighting his case in a high-powered module to where you could have been condemned? They have, they, have, uh, they have areas like that, you know, where they separate you from the general population. So if he made it to prison and was on death row, he would have had to go through uh, some appeals. All right, so here, here we go. In 2009, uh, Boosie was sentenced to four years in prison on drug and gun charges. In 2010, he was indicted on first degree murder charges and was also sentenced to eight years on multiple charges of drug possession with intent to distribute. Hatch, Boosie's real name, spent three and a half years on death row before being found not guilty of murder in 2012. No, that's not true. No? Not unless they, they house you differently out there. I don't I know. See. So death row but is after you've been convicted. Exactly. They can't put you on death row. Like, you might get convicted, so you might wind up here. That's, they, they don't do that. You know what okay. I'm saying? You have to actually You don't think Louisiana might be a little different? No. Uh, they could be. They could be. It's like the deep south. You, yeah, like <laughs> you have to come off death row instead of like, you know, getting found guilty and being placed on death row. So I don't, I don't know Louisiana law, so I can't say whether it happened or well, not. Well, he was facing the death penalty. I know if he was out here, it wouldn't have went in that okay. order. Yeah. I don't want to comment exactly because I don't know the exact details. Gotcha. Next time we talk, we could, we could talk about it. You know, next gotcha. time me and him I have an interview, I'm going to bring it up. Right. But he was facing the death penalty. Mm -hmm. And... You know, the way he told me was that. You know, they were talking, we got you on eight murders and all this shit. You know, I want my lawyer, period. You know what I'm saying? They came at me with some shit one time about male and teeth. You know, I told them, suck my dick. <laughs> suck my dick. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, my CEOs beat them on a murder charge too. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, they was after us, Vlad. They was after me, but. You know, I knew they ain't had shit on me, but you know, I'm staying silent. I wouldn't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I was gonna go to that motherfucker. I was gonna go to that motherfucking death row chair, a motherfucking, a motherfucking hero. That's why I was gonna go to that motherfucking, a motherfucking hero to all the real niggas in the world. I was gonna go down that bitch a hero. I was gonna be on every project while in the motherfucking world, cause I stayed silent. Yeah, I don't know nothing. Yeah. If y'all know all that, what the fuck you need to talk to me for? I don't know nothing. Which were, what, 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 what was he in there for? He was facing uh, multiple murders. Multiple murders? Yeah, his own baby mother testified against him. W one of the murders was his baby mother's brother, which he ended up beating. Uh -huh. He spent like half a million dollars, but he ended up beating everything, but yeah. yeah. Thank God he had the money. Thank God he had the money. Yeah. Or else, he, or else it would have been still be no on death good. row or yeah. he might be dead. True. Um, but yeah, it, it was one of those things where he was down to, to ride it all out. Mm -hmm. Not too many rappers <laughs> could say that. Yeah, I mean, when you committed to that lifestyle, though, you already know what come with it. And don't, uh, that's the problem. A lot of people don't accept what come with it. They pretend to, but, you know, a lot of people fold in the process, man. Well, Takashi 6 9 the sixth co-defendant now in that case, has pl pled, has pled guilty and taken a plea deal. How many co-defendants are there? Might be eight. For some reason, the number eight sticks in my mind. But six people, including Shadi. So if two more, oh, Shadi already pled guilty? Yeah, I think 10, 10 to 15 years is what he's facing. That's not bad. How old is he? About like 34? 30, 30, 30 something, 30. yeah. Oh, he good. He good. He good. Hopefully he'll still have some money when he touched down. Maybe. Yeah. But uh, Takashi, yeah, he went told on everybody. Yeah. And uh, they're saying he might get out in September. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, uh, my you know, wife said he can't release no more rah rah music because <laughs> that's <laughs> he lost that. You know. You, I'm I'm really interested to see the first song that he comes out with. What what that's going to be about. And it's crazy because he almost has to stage some kind of comeback. Yeah. Or else, what is he going to do? And, you know, who's going to support him? Who's really going to want to, you know, be involved with him and his yeah. legacy? We're in very uncharted waters right here. Really? When he gets out. Because really? in general, hip-hop, you know, I mean, people have accepted that certain people in hip-hop are just, you know, civilians and, you know, are going to press charges or whatever else. <laughs> right, right. But there's also, you know, being a victim is one thing, but actually being involved in crimes and telling on all your co-defendants, that's a whole different animal. That's something that I don't, I don't, oh. you know, if me and you were doing crimes together and I got caught, we both got caught and I told on you to, so I could get out, can't justify that being a civilian. Like, you, you know you what I mean? No, you can't. I'd be a rat. Because you'd cross the line already. Cross the line. That's why yeah. I never cross these lines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm strictly on the legal side. Strictly over here. Don't, don't do no crimes. It. You say Not don't all the crimes. It. I pay my taxes. <laughs> I stop at the red light. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's right. I don't try to run from the police. Like, I'm, I'm cool. I'll, I'll just play my, my straight and narrow. But yeah, he's going to get out. And I don't know what's going to happen. No one I don't know. does. No one does. And, and in today's climate, it, that's, that's a trip, you know, that it's really no code or no, you know, no guidelines that people operate under. You know, it's like if we accept it or we, did, you know, if the general consensus is, well, you know, and I know a lot of people going to try to justify it, but, oh, well, they were going to kill him. And, you they know. They were fucking his baby yeah, mama. Yeah, they, exactly. But I've seen in the comments. It's not his fault. He was a victim. I wonder how his concerts are going to look. <laughs> how about that? It ain't going to be no gangsters up in there. You can pretty much believe that. No, yeah. it won't be. No real gangsters. No. None. 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 So that's pretty much. You know, you know what I'm wondering? Who's going to do music with them? That's that to me is the most interesting question. And people who's are always going to do a, whore for that. You who know, is people going to whore do a, for names. Oh yeah, who's going to do a song with Takashi? Yeah, because God who's knows gonna be the first he got big songs name. with right. His last <laughs> album, you know, songs with Kanye, A Boogie, I think Nicki Minaj is on it. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, they did a video together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me look up Takashi that album. Let me just see. Did his album do good? Uh, I'm not sure because once it came out, he was already in prison and it was sort of like. Nobody to There was no it. promotion. Got there you. was no nothing. Yeah. Like, hold on a second. Let's take a look at Dummy Boy, who the, the features are. Uh, you know, Bobby Schmurter's on it. He already said, I interviewed Bobby. And Bobby said, I'm not fucking with this dude at all. At the time that you did the song with Takashi, you know, he was still out. N none of this shit had happened. But now that you found out that you find out that he's locked up and he's telling on everybody and, and getting everyone else locked up, would you do a song with Takashi after you got out? Hell, motherfucker, no. I don't even want to be next to that now. <laughs> I'm good, you know? That's why I be telling motherfuckers, you got to treat these rappers like rappers. Yo, these are just rappers, baby. Are you from the hood? You supposed to know that these are just rappers. Don't expect nothing from them. These motherfuckers had everybody locked up. You know what I'm saying? These entertainers. You know what I'm saying? That's why I say from these kids, too. You look at these entertainers, they just entertainers. They ain't, they ain't living that shit they be talking. Yeah. You know, Tory Lane's little baby. That's mm -hmm. a street dude that I, you know, I interviewed myself. Mm -hmm. uh, Gunna, like, there's a bunch of, you know, A Boogie. Like, there's a bunch of street-oriented artists that's all over his album. Well, he had that buzz going on. He then. had a huge buzz. Yeah, he had the buzz going on. And you can tell what he would do down the line. You couldn't predict that. Nobody could predict what he would do. So it was just like he's talking shit to everybody in L.A. Now he's talking shit to everybody in Houston. Now he's, you know, he's getting into it over here. Oh, you know, suck my dick. And, you know, every, yeah. you know, everywhere you go, every week, every three or four days, this is more yep. Takashi in the news. So he was a supernova. Well, I mean, Big U said in our interview, he said that. Uh... Now, guess what happens to 6 9 Let me give you 6 9 Seven years from now, 
he gonna still be 6'9", the kid who was disrespectful. The money is gone now. The labels have moved on to other projects. Guess what happens? People still gonna remember what he said. People gonna still remember. Mm -hmm. Ain't you the kid, the king of New York? Oh man, I was on some stuff back then. Oh no. True. You know, who might just say, hey, here's a thousand dollars, just go punch this dude in the face. That, for him. Yeah, or go pop him. Yeah, a thousand dollars will get you popped in the streets today. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it yeah, will. Go, go shoot him in the leg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or wherever you want to shoot him. Yeah, exactly. You, you know what I'm saying? I interviewed his baby mother. Um, she she wasn't, you know, she wasn't in support of anything that he was doing. Right. Some time later, he actually IDs the person who he, he's giving the, 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 you know, allegedly gave the money to, and, and the guy's name was? Kuda. Uh, Kuda, right. And then Kuda ends up, I guess, doing the shooting. I guess he shot up in the air, and Takashi's actually cooperating and said the name. I just think that's so fucking whack. I, uh, right. I, th I think Kuda's out on bail friend. right now, that, right? You know, I, I just, the only reason I feel Kuda would have did it was off the strength of his relationship with Danny. I don't even think it was just more the money. You know, I, he has a whole song named after him. I've seen, Kuda's been in the house that got raided. You know, he's been around. So it's just like, you told him to do something and he did it out of love for you and now you're snitching on him. The person that has accepted a plea deal was Kuda B. Mm -hmm. That was the guy who you see him on video telling him to, to go shoot one of the chief, you know, chief Where, Keith's people. Chicago, he ended up, okay. I guess, allegedly they're saying that he ended up shooting in the, that vicinity and then Takashi told on him. Yeah. About the shooting. Yeah. He's out Sent right him now. On the mission and he's stuff. on parole. Yeah. He, well, he made bail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's awaiting his sentencing. Mm. Um, that's the, the only person I know that's out. Yeah, yeah man. I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't fuck with it. I don't respect it, right? Uh, you know, and yeah, because once you commit to the lifestyle, you bound by all the, the the rules and the codes and the guidelines that you know that's set forth, and you should know what they are because you know if ignorance ain't no excuse for the law, damn sure ain't no excuse for not knowing how to get down in the streets because that's that's life or death. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. I remember I interviewed Mo Three. He's a rapper out of uh, Dallas, uh -huh. and he said how his best friend told on him. Have you had a situation where people snitched on you? Uh, my best friend. Your best friend snitched on you? Best friend. Can you talk about that situation? Yes, yeah, that's what I went to prison for. Oh, for the two years? Yeah. Over that robbery? Oh, well, it was four robberies, four. you said? I only had two, but I took his two. After I took his two, he still told on me. I already took your two. What did you tell for? Okay, wait, hold on. This sounds crazy. So you had four robberies. I had being, two. You had two robberies you'd be charged Then I came for. back and got indicted two more times. But I'm knowing because, that these not my. It's cool. I'm going to okay. take my partner charge. I'm already in here. He not in here. I'm already in here. Did you ever see him after that? Yeah. Okay, what Showed happened? Showed up in my video shoot that holds your tongue. The guy that told on you showed up at your video shoot. Yeah. Okay. What happened? We was on the block. We was on Fawaz Lane. He walked up. Big Mama's chicken sit in the corner. And then it's a gas station across the street. I seen him when he was walking. We we in front of the shoe store and we in front of Sharks. It's a little, a little fish and chicken spot right there in the hood. I see him walking from a distance. I'm already seeing him. Like everybody right here, the cameraman right here, we do. And I, I see him coming. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, he know what to say. What's up, bro? Like, what's up? I see you doing your thing, bitch, doing the video and shit. Yeah. I ain't gonna lie. I love that nigga so much, I was cool with him for a little bit. It didn't settle in my head that this nigga told on me. Have you ever, because you've had people tell on you, right? I'm sure they have. Uh, but you don't know. Well, yeah, I do know that, you know, it's been people that told, but I don't know who told. Aha. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? 
I don't, I you don't, don't know who told. No. I mean, just told about activities we did, reported activities that we did. My name came up, you know, motherfucker like, oh, yeah, I heard this and I heard that. You know, police and pulled up on the motherfucker, you know, <laughs> <laughs> accusing me of certain shit. But, you know, I just but keep But you don't know who did it? Nah. No one ever took the stand against you? No one ever wrote a statement? Nothing? No. I usually catch cases by myself, you know. And if I catch case with somebody else, it's like, Bro, get your lawyer, you know, do what you do. I'm going to do my thing. You know what I mean? Just, you know, remain silent. <laughs> you know, we talked about this before, about working with police. You knew Nipsey, mm -hmm. and you, were, you had a lot of respect for him mm -hmm. for, for different reasons, mm -hmm. both your personal relationship and what he's done as a whole. Mm -hmm. If after the shooting had happened... If you were driving down the street and you saw Eric Holder just hanging out at a store on the corner, what would you have done when the, when the manhunt was still going? Hmm. Probably would have followed him and popped him. You would have shot him? Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. So you would have risked your own freedom to kill the person who killed Nipsey Hussle? Really? Yep. You're the first person that I've asked that question to that's answered it in that way. Yeah. I would have did. I love the dude, man. I really did. You know, just for the person that he was. Hmm. Not nothing he did special for me or nothing like, oh, he brought me out on stage. Oh, I'm forever indebted to you. You know, <laughs> right. nothing like that. Nothing you know, like just, that. you know, he had a concert, as a matter of fact, and um, he was performing with another artist who had gang ties to a rival gang of, he, of Nips. So I took it upon myself to attend, just, you know, to be like monitoring, you know, the climate, mm -hmm. just in case it would have went up or whatever. I really wasn't going there to do nothing, but if I would have had to do something, of course, I wasn't going to run, you know? And, um, you know, I it was like, uh, Everything, everything was cool, you know. He even did a video that night. I think he, he put us in, and we, we was chopping it up in the VIP room. But yeah, I, I had a lot of admiration and respect for him as a, as a, as a gangster, as an individual, as an artist, just as a total, just together dude. Man, he was all the way together, and he never showed me a different side of him. So just to honor the code that I live by. If I could have followed him and got away, you know, and have thought I had a reasonable chance to get away with it, yeah, I'd have popped him. Okay, but had you not gotten away, you would be facing premeditated murder? Mm -hmm. what, what degree murder would that be in That'd that situation? Be first degree. First degree, which mm -hmm. means premeditated. You, had, you, you planned had a murder. when you saw him to do something to him, to, to murder him. You stalked him and, you know, you carried out your plan. First degree is the highest level. Yes, yes. First degree murder, well, with your background, with your criminal record, would be life Over. in prison. Over, It'd be no possibility of parole. Doesn't matter if it was for the greater good. Doesn't matter what this guy did. You would be convicted of murder mm -hmm. and gotten life in prison. Mm -hmm. And you'd be willing to take that on in order to kill this person. I'd be willing to take that risk. That risk. Yeah, because I'm not just going to surrender after I do that. You know, everything coming with that, I probably wind up getting gunned down in the streets. I'm not just going to put my hands up and say, oh, okay, y'all got me. You know, take me down. I, you, you kill one person, you know, there's it's, it's nothing that, you know, to, to continue for your safety and survival. You know what I mean? I had recently interviewed Chi Ali, mm -hmm. who killed his uh, baby mother's brother. Wow. And he went on the run for like, I think like a year and a half or two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, man, he was just, he described what it was like being on the run. What happened to make you leave Atlanta and go back to New York? America's Most Wanted. Okay, so then the, the TV show ran. My baby mother told me. She called me and told me they were airing it. I forget what date, whatever date it was. She was like, yo, you know they putting you on that show. I heard you. So I was living at my development in Atlanta for a while by then. So we thought it best to leave. Because now your face is all over national television. Right. 
And I guess they ran it twice, right? There's two episodes yeah, they ran on it. Um, I remember the first time they ran it was November of November of 2000. They ran it in November of 2000. And then they ran it again in like February of 2001. Okay. Do you think if they didn't run that show, you'd still be living under the radar somewhere? Uh-uh. No. Okay. I well, think I would have ran a lot longer though. So you had to rob drug dealers? I had to do every night. Nah, I mean, it was whatever. It was everything goes. It was, you know, we was selling weed. We might be selling coke. We might be selling some fake coke. We might pull a jukes. We might. It was, you know, I'm on the run for a homicide. Said it was a really miserable way of living. Oh, yeah. Being on be. the run is one of the, you know. Yeah, it had to be. You're looking over your shoulder constantly. You constantly. really can't get comfortable. You can't get comfortable. You know? Uh yeah, man, that really says a lot, though, about your your uh, principles. You'd actually be willing to to do that sacrifice for your ideas. Yeah, and I and I apologize to my family right now for even you know even putting myself in that in that state of mind where I would sacrifice all that. But it's just ingrained in me, you know, to, to keep it to keep it true, you know. And I I know any any young homie that really represent like I represent. If something was to happen to me, you know, I know they'd get out. I know, so I know a lot of people that'd get out for me. It's not even from my hood, you know, mm. and it's been proven in certain, you know, certain instances, and I just know it, you know, beyond that. Well, instead of stalking this person and going through this extreme level of risk, I wouldn't have stalked him. I'd have just hit a corner. The first corner he hit, okay, it looked well, no, like well, it was no, open. Well, he'd well, got knocked right, down. Right. It wouldn't have been no elaborate. <laughs> oh, he's at thirty-three Mockingbird Lane. I'll be back at right, nine. No, no. Well, yeah, well, was, what I'm saying is, but instead of doing that, the other option is nine one one. Hey, that that you murderer know, you're looking for. This, Vlad, I'm back to not this. Calling the police, Vlad. If you don't it, want to be the person. If it was a serial killer next door, like you asked me, Vlad. <laughs> I, unless I was going to go knock him down, personally, I would not call the police on him. Okay, so, so let, let, let's keep going with this scenario. You don't call the police. No. And you feel that killing him has too much of a risk of you getting caught yourself, right? Because mm -hmm. there's cameras everywhere, you're in Hollywood. You're not going to get away. You're not going to kill someone in Hollywood and walk away from right, it. Right, right. It's not right, going to happen. Right. I don't care what alleyway you're on. There's, right. there's a camera there. I'm, I'm with you on that. Okay? Uh -huh. So you let him go. Mm -hmm. And he ends up killing a bunch of other people. How do you feel at that point? Because you could have just like called the police. You could have called the police to end it all this. I feel like I couldn't get him. Police ain't an option. They're not, not an, an option. option. So you wouldn't all. feel bad about all. Let's say he goes and kills some kids afterwards. Because he, he's crazy at this point. This is this is this is a a potentially a serial killer. I missed my opportunity. Miss your opportunity. Somebody else got to get it now, or okay. the police got to do their job and catch up with them. But you're not helping They the just got to do it around me. Nah, not at all. Not at all. Mm -mm. Okay, I respect it. Bye. You know, I would have called the police. Yeah. I I'm, not, I'm not trying You're to shoot You're a civilian. I'm a civilian. I'm not. I'm a gangster. I'm not going home and getting my shotgun and going to try to. Nah, I'm not yeah. doing that. I'm I mean, just going to call the police. And if it's not serious enough to feel like, if I feel like, okay, this dude then killed the old lady down at the end of the block and then killed this nice uh, couple over here and I'm, I know that he's just killing people. I might figure, you know what? I might be in this dude's lineup. So then I would act on that. I wouldn't call the police on him. Wouldn't and if I police. didn't, you know, if I didn't, you know, it, it'd just be what it was. Man, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't do police, man. Cause yeah. yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> I, I respect it. Righteous. I, I, I respect and I it. respect you using them for for what yeah. you have to use them for. There, you know what I'm saying. That's their job to serve and protect in the capacity that they do. It just don't seem like it translates into that when they're dealing with African Americans. So you know, I don't like them. I distrust them. I've had bad experiences with them since eight, nine years old. So. I'm going to keep on riding with that. Well, you know, with the Nipsey situation, the day after he got killed, he had a meeting set up with, like, I guess, the chief of police of LAPD. I heard about that. 
you know, to work on trying to fix the problems. Mm -hmm. And I remember I read an interview, I think it was the New York Times, because our, our interview got mentioned in it as well. And I don't know if it was the chief or someone else, and they were saying how, you know, he said, people try to paint Nipsey as a gangster, but we didn't view him like this at all. So if you were to ask me, would I trust him to babysit my grandkids? My answer is yes. Mm -hmm. That's the chief of police. <laughs> That's like an LAPD and guy saying this. And like a motherfucker. <laughs> and not tell him right to his face. You a lying <laughs> son of a bitch. You wouldn't have had Nipsey nowhere around your grandkids at no point in his life. Mm. Yeah, I do not believe that. Yeah, so he's just same, trying to paint himself. The same yeah. chief of police that hired an officer back that was convicted of stalking his ex and assaulting her and all this kind of stuff and you 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 go through loopholes and get him reinstated and all that it's politics man mm. you know what i mean and you just saying the right shit right now to make people think oh we have a great chief man fuck you <laughs> well man listen uh huge loss with nipsey he was working you know i mean because even um big you works with uh i don't know I don't think the police, but with the gang intervention with, program. Yeah, with, yeah, with the city. They have a lot of those going yeah. on in different cities. They have one in Long Beach too. Yeah. Gang intervention prevention program. Got it. Um, and they do good work in the community. A lot of them do good work. They hire a lot of OGs, and with you know, usually with influence because you know a worthless G is worthless. You know, so if you have some type type of influence or a reputation that they can parlay into you being a, a, you know, um, a facilitator for dialogue amongst the gangs in the city, you know, different races, you know, they have different, uh, you know, racial tensions going on in different mm -hmm. cities. So they call them in to like mediate before things get out of hand or, and, and to keep, uh, a check on the temperature of like what's oh it's getting hot over here they having a lot of shootings over here yeah. what's going on over there what happened oh well you know dude did something what's his name and he came and shot him so now they after them and this that and the other so they'll try to if it's a way to resolve it without further violence they'll try to you know um implement themselves into the situation i think this like last year or something me and you sat we were smoking in your car. And I was like bringing up business ideas. I said, man, how come Crips don't sell their own bandanas, right? Well, you know, why doesn't this turn into real businesses? And then later on, you know, earlier this year, Killer Mike had a show on Netflix, mm -hmm. uh, Trigger Warning, right, where he actually got some Crips and Bloods and they made their own sodas. Mm -hmm. Crip Cola and, and Blood blood Pop. Mm. And they actually sold it. Did you ever see that at all? No. I heard about it though. Yeah, no, I interviewed Trigger him. Trigger warning, I heard about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, man, where he actually, you know, he's like, here's a group that has a strong following, let's turn it into a business. Mm -hmm. They actually had Crip Cola and, and Blood Pop, and they That's sold funny. it at stores, and they, they were competing, <laughs> competing against each other economically. <laughs> and, and stuff like that. No, we, we talked about it. it was a we cool did, little, we it was did. A cool now I'm little, laughing at the Crip Cola. Yeah, Crip Cola. Yeah, yeah. It was blue, I think. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Nipsey Blue. And, um, you know, but here, here's an actual situation where people are taking this, uh, you know, a, a gang culture and turning it into a legitimate business. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's ever going to be a point, let's just say just in L.A., L.A., Long Beach, whatever, the, the surrounding areas, mm -hmm. where these different gangs aren't shooting each other anymore? They're, they're competing against each other, against each other economically. They're just trying to start businesses and trying to make money legally. I think before they do that, I think it would be collaborations between different gangs that had certain things in common, like either proximity or, you know, uh, different 
rivals or whatever like that and be like, okay, well, we always been allied, so let's build this together. So I think it'd be people working together or it'd be like, well, I know dude over there, I like the way he get down, so I'm gonna go approach him and then if they can strike up some kind of business arrangement, then he gonna bring in a couple of his homeboys, he gonna bring in a couple of their homeboys. So I don't think it'll be like, okay, let's outdo them financially and let's be the biggest, richest set you know, with the, you know, to the exclusion of everybody else, I think it will be more people working together to build things within the community. I mean, look, man, I mean, it's no secret. I, I make part of my income interviewing gang members, former gang members like yourself, you know, because you're not the only one. <laughs> like, you know, there's you, there is... I'm still a gang member. I'm always been okay, a gang cool. member. Okay, cool. I mean, you know, I'm I, 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 you know, some former. people don't want to... No, I'm not former. <laughs> okay, I'm... got it. Yeah. Got it. But, you know, uh, you know, Big U has been on my show. Uh, Bosco has been on my show a few times. BG Knockout is a regular guest. I make money. You know, part of my income comes from interviewing gang members and having them tell their story and then monetizing those stories on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I do not have nearly the accessibility of actual gang members. You see what I'm saying? Nothing right. stopping all of y'all from doing a similar type of business. Go ahead and open up a YouTube account and start documenting this. Mm-hmm. Start documenting your a own life stuff. Pe- a couple of people do. You yeah. know, I write books. I make there you music. Go. There you, know you go. You know what I mean? So and, and the I, same I have, type of thing. You're right. Yeah, I have, You're right. Di- I have different avenues to, you know, to present myself yeah. but to. But that's just you. Imagine it, the actual groups get it's always individuals that are doing it. imagine right. the actual group getting together say okay listen man fuck all this drug shit fuck all this robbery shit fuck this extortion shit mm-hmm. pimping shit all this stuff that carries long prison sentences let's really focus on actual businesses and, and doing stuff where we could capitalize off of the world's obsession with our lifestyle right because it's there right it is it is and at the same time you have to understand too that Within gang cultures, that's a part of the income. Robberies, pimping, drugs. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you know, it's like you you have to present some type of a, uh, economic alternative yeah. to make people leave those other bad things, quote unquote bad things, Alone, well, but they are bad guess things. what? Prison time guess what? With guess them, what? Yeah. Guess and, what? And death. Guess what? That's the oldest profession in the world. People still gonna buy pussy. People still gonna go buy drugs to get high on. Yep. You know. So what? If the gang quit selling them and we just all the way out of the legal business, then who takes over that business? Doesn't matter. It won't be y'all. No, it does let, matter. Let, then let, because let, that's let some, someone else no, take that risk. No, it does matter because somebody else gets that economy. Somebody else gets get that bread. They can so, have it. And, and they're draining your community because people in your community are still going to get high. People in your community are still going to uh, pay for sex. You know what I mean? So it's like, okay, we don't do it no more. Now somebody else come in and take. That's like how that's that's the same situation with the mafia when they were saying we ain't gonna do no drugs. You know, yeah. we ain't, we gonna get rid of this and that. And then you had certain families that's like, man, fuck what they talking about. We gonna keep these drugs cracking because it's a business. I interviewed Michael Frenzies, who was the highest ranking member of the mafia from one of the five. What's his name? Michael Frenzies. Okay. Yeah, it's up on my uh, YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. But he was a capo in the Colombo crime family. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the original five families. Yeah, one of the original five families. Mm-hmm. And uh, he made most of his money. He had this this gasoline tax scam where he was making like $10 million a week. He, he basically had all these gas stations and he would collect tax from the gas stations and then just keep the money and then just... <laughs> start a new company and then do the same thing. And he just kept doing that over and over again. Mm-hmm. He was making literally $10 million a week doing the shit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he said something interesting. I want you to understand that everybody talks about murder all the time. It's the most serious thing, and it is, that people attribute to the, to the evil of that life. But here, here's the way we looked at it, whether right or wrong. When we come into that life, we take an oath. And at that time, we're told if we violate the oath, we could pay for it with our lives and your best friend might be called upon because the life becomes before anything. Now, we weren't random killers. 
Murder was taken extremely seriously. It could only be ordered by the boss. There was always discussion about it. And, uh, you know, we weren't doing drive-by shootings. We weren't just randomly killing people. You know, it was confined to us. And when I say us, it was we that knew that we could pay the price if we made a mistake or we did something wrong. Now, what I said before is that I saw people die for, I don't think they should have, because the life gets corrupted. But I always want to say this, we weren't random killers, we didn't go around murdering people, it was taken very seriously. And I think that's a wrap, you know, you see all of these wars, well who are we killing? We're killing each other. Not to say one is any better than the other, because the other day murder is murder. Right. But the, the Mafia was a different type of organization. Mm -hmm. Structure and, uh, and discipline. Structure and discipline. Yeah. It's understandable and there's lawlessness out here right now because, there, you know, everybody can, you know, you can pretty much be who you want to be. It's nobody to answer to. You know, it's so disrespectful how a lot of the young dudes today in better positions than guys older than them that paved the way for them to be able to maneuver around the streets like they do. They don't even pay them homage. You know, it's like, uh, you a has-been. It's over with for you. It's my turn now. But, you know, they don't get no credit for the, you know, for the things that they done did to make it safe for them to operate like they operate. So <sighs> the game is fucked up, man. The game fucked up. We, are we just hoping that, you know, with the loss of Nip, Everybody maintain that spirit right now that's yeah. going around of love and unity and, you know, peace and working together and viewing each other as brothers and sisters. You know, that's, that's pervading right now in L.A. and in the surrounding areas and even spots outside of the state. But it has to be something that's consistently... Um, you know, organized to, to, to make bigger things happen from it. Not just we get along now. What are we doing with this power that we now have, this power unity? Because solidarity is power. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you need the right people with the right uh, solutions or projections to sit down and kind of like, steer this in the, you know, in the direction that's going to benefit not just the people that's from gangs and involved in gangs, but the community as a whole. Yeah, man. Like I said, I hope it stays up. I hope. I, that, I believe uh, it will. I let's, it uh, will. you know, I mean, you've seen, I guess, after the riots, you had, you had, um, are you in prison? Yeah. Yeah. Prison. But, but there was a peace treaty, a peace treaty mm -hmm. that, that had some level of success. Yeah, it did. It did. You know? I think we're seeing the second iteration of that, and I'm hoping that's going to stay a lot longer. Right. Um, because as as glorious as Nipsey Hussle's funeral looked to the world, Nipsey didn't get to see it. No. His family are crying still. His he had I think two or three kids. They'll never get to see their dad. Laura London, you know, never get to spend any time with him. His parents, his mom and dad are grieving. It's nothing glorious about what's happening around him right now. Right. It just looks glorious to the outside. Right. You know what I'm saying? Well, is 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 the glory comes in the spirit that yeah. that it has um, caused to take root in the city. You know, it's like now if you own some, you know animosity with the next man or you talking about going to do some harm to somebody or like yeah. you know it's like that shit is whack now that shit is being looked at as that's kind of whack oh yeah. you know it's better shit that we could be doing right now with our time you know i'm i'm trying to be a mogul like nip you know i'm trying to i'm trying to set a good example like nip you know what i'm saying it's like a lot of people want to emulate him and being in the game as long as I've been and being my age, I looked at Nip like, you know, it's my little homie stomped down, you know, he's solid, but Nip was 33 years old. And, mm. you know, hip hop, you get into hip hop, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, 13, 14, so a lot to, a, to most of, you know, the hip hop community, Nip was something like a big homie. You know, because mm -hmm. he influenced a lot of 
athletes and things like that. And these guys in their 20s and, you know, uh, in, you know, late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. And, you know, that was their big homie, you know. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a stronger it's a stronger attraction to want to keep his keep his name honored in the right capacity. You know what I'm saying? So I think I think that's what's going to cause it to be more than just a fly by night, you know, a hey, let's let's photo op and get together and you know, throw up our gangs and hold up our rags, you know, because this is the spirit right now. You know, I I think I really think that with the people that's involved in pushing it as long as they keep their foot on the paddle we, yeah. we headed in the right direction i hope so man rest in peace nipsey hustle man oh, uh man. go listen to that crenshaw album go listen to that uh victory lap those are my two favorite projects from him you know yeah. he owns the masters so it goes right back to his family yeah, make sure you go go buy it. some yeah. uh, some marathon clothing do uh, that do that you know and uh you know let, let, let's keep Let's keep his spirit alive in terms of what he stood for, because I think the reason why Nipsey was being celebrated was actually not for his rapping, but what he did outside of rap. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Because he mm -hmm. was never a mainstream artist. No, he wasn't Tupac musically. Mm -mm. Not to say one's but better he than the other. To the streets. Yeah, he never had those huge radio hits. Yeah, he was more of an underground rapper. Right, but. You know, he just dropped his first studio. He just dropped album, his first you know studio. I mean? album, yeah, but it's yeah, what yeah. he did outside of the rap, mm -hmm. which is why he still sold out the Staples Center and why there was. Such That's a, a combination a of combination. It, it's really, I, I believe, it's really who he was as a person. Yeah. Because if you, because you could kind of almost get to know him through his music. Yeah. You know, just because what he what he represented, he spoke on with conviction. Yeah. And you could feel it. You yeah. know, you could feel it from him. And if you, if you, that's if you did know him, if you did know him, like we was blessed to, you know, actually know him, you saw that that was a genuine spirit. It wasn't nothing fake about him. It there wasn't, wasn't nothing fraudulent about him. No. It wasn't nothing like, you know, let me put this air on right now because I'm Nipsey Hussle and, you know, I'm that nigga right now. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't never, it, it was always with respect and it was always with, you know, I always saw him seeking knowledge and a deeper understanding about whatever was taking place. You yeah. know, and, and his mom pretty much said the same thing. You know, when when she spoke on him, I was like, yeah. So I did, I did pretty much pick him. You know, pick his character. Yeah. You know. So. Yes, sir. Well, uh, Trey D, man, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Make sure they uh. You, you let them know, man. I got that certified project out. That shit killing right now. Yo, uh, grab that shit. I got to, yeah, I got that. Uh, got that gangster film series coming out too. So. Yep. Is DW Flame out yet? No, nah, he he goes to court on the twenty sixth. Okay. So. God willing. Yeah, man. Free DW pray. Flame. Free uh, DW I, Flame. Vlad hollering for you. You know right. you're a star, boy. That's right. I know there's some <laughs> cell phones in, in the in the jail right now. I know Vlad TV. I heard Vlad TV's big in the in the jail and prison system. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's right. what I heard from a lot of people. So I know y'all getting this. Right. That's right. what it is. Until Good next time. Man. No Peace. doubt.